Uh, all right, so pre-announcement. Uh, this is on behalf of a student organization, Femtech. Uh, they're screening a movie called Code Debugging the Gender Gap, uh, Tuesday, April 19th. That's tomorrow at 4 p.m. in Sibley. Uh, and there will be a panel of tech leaders and the director and food. That's lots of things. Uh, and so this documentary, uh, good luck finding a plug. Uh, so this documentary explores why it is that there are so few women and Latin and black developers in the tech industry. Uh, and so the question is, why should you care? And so one reason is, uh, well, it's good to note that automation over time is going to eat up lots of mid-skill jobs uh, and, and low, even low to mid-skill jobs in the longer term. Uh, and as a consequence, society seems like it might bifurcate into two groups of people, those who've got a lot of stuff uh, and those who don't. Uh, and so if you had the education, maybe you can make a living. Otherwise, you might not. Uh, I guess that fan sucks. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, so it seems like it's a good thing that you, as the people who are going to have all the education and all that power, to be aware of these issues. So if you want, you can go check out this movie. Um, there are some selfish reasons, which is just, well, there are a whole lot of untapped cognitive resources, brilliant people out there who have no uh, access to education. And you can start at least pushing slightly on it and improve you and your children and whoever's lives. Uh, and there's also the altruistic reason, which is that, of course, you guys will be super powerful uh, fairly soon. And so it's nice to empower those who have less. So maybe check out this movie. All right. And then as far as announcements go, uh, Project 3 is due today, of course. But you know that's not the whole story, because there's this fairly generous late policy. Uh, if it is the case that you pass all the local tests, uh, but Gradescope is failing you, uh, and you've also tried creating a test.html that matches the failed test, because it tells you what parameters it gives you and what it expects, uh, then email me. I know of one person for whom this is happening. It has something to do with. Uh, using a list files operation. So whenever you build your quad tree, you don't actually have to list any of the files in the directories. You could just assume they're there. But if you write code that checks to see if the files exist as you're building the tree, it seems in some very limited circumstances. I still haven't put my finger on it. Things can go a little weird. So just throwing that out there. Yeah. What? Oh, let's do that. Yeah, those need to be there. Sorry. All right, let's publish them. Uh, and so there's also homework coming out. Uh, it'll be by tomorrow night, maybe today. We'll see. Uh, but I'm guessing probably not, because I'm really trying to focus my efforts on making sure we can get through Project 3 together, uh, and also putting these slides up. So um, just be aware that's going to be out. It's going to be roughly the size of homework 2, which was the percolation one, so not particularly huge. Uh, but it'll be some work. Uh, and lastly, uh, that will be due next Monday. And lastly, uh, today's lecture is going to be a little less dense than the others, just because, uh, well, I know a lot of people have Project 3 on the mind, so I don't want to tax you too much. All right, so the slides are about to appear. And if they're not there, then they'll be there soon. OK, so today we're going to wrap up uh, the core of our sorting. We'll have one more sorting lecture, but this is the last bit that relates, that's all part of it, an integrated whole. Uh, this diagram is of the optimal sorting algorithm for 15 elements. I won't describe it in any detail today, but you'll get a little bit of a sense of what this thing might be soon. And so I'll start by kicking off uh, an overview of why we've spent so much time with sorting lately. And so really, right? I mean, maybe it would have been better to say this before we did sorting, but hey, you know, while we're almost done with it, may as well bring it up that uh, sorting is an important question or for problem because one, it's really useful, right? You can put things in order, sorting spreadsheets, sorting grades, sorting whatever. Uh, but it's also useful, not just for literally putting things in order, but it can also be used as a tool to solve tasks and speed them up in non-trivial ways. So if you wanted to know if an array has a duplicate in it, how could you use sorting? So the most naive thing is you just look at every pair. That's going to be n squared. Uh, but if you wanted to use sorting somehow, how could you speed up uh, the process of duplicate finding? Sort it, and then what? And then check if any adjacents are the same. So you can use it to speed up duplicate finding. You can use sorting to in increase the speed of the so-called uh, three-sum problem, where you find three items that sum to 0. And you can take what would be an n-cubed algorithm and make it n-squared. In fact, we did that in one of the discussions. Uh, and so as we've seen, in addition to being just a really useful problem, there are many ways to sort an array. And each of, it ha each of those different ways has you know, trade-offs and neat features. And one of my favorite is that quick sort, the fastest known sort for the general case, uh, it actually harnesses randomness. So that's neat, right? So just as a way to steep ourselves in algorithms and really jump in, uh, and we can understand that even a relatively seemingly boring question like sorting has a lot of theoretical richness. Okay? So to summarize all the sorts we came up with, we had heap sort, insertion sort, merge sort, random quick sort. Uh, and these are just a handful. right? I'm not listing here the boring selection sort uh, or any of the other sorts out there. 
But the highlights are that uh, randomized quick sort, it was our fastest sort, but it was not stable. Uh, merge sort was our fastest sort that was stable. And then we had insertion sort, which had these two special niches where it was very fast, which is almost sorted arrays uh, and n less than or equal to 15. And then we had heap sort just as an alternate view of a divide and conquer sort that, for reasons that have to do with the way real machines are built, is not super good. Okay. So any thoughts about our sorts before we plunge in and talk about the future? Okay, so good. We invented a bunch of sorts. This one's awesome. This one's also awesome. This one's awesome in certain circumstances. To set the stage for our day, we're going to do some math problems to set up uh, things we'll need later on in the lecture. So we're going to do some math problems out of nowhere. Now you'll notice this is the recording in my house version rather than the live lecture. Uh, and it's because the live lecture discussion went kind of long. Uh, a student raised what I thought was an, uh, what he thought was a bug in the uh, proof that we were doing. And in fact, it was actually just an interesting uh, observation that we ended up being a, a bit of a digression. So I'm re-recording this for conciseness. Um, if you want to watch the original one, there will be a link in the slides that you can click on uh, that will let you watch the live one if you prefer that for some reason. But uh, here is this version. Okay, so the math problem I don't know where is, consider the functions n factorial and n over 2 to the n over 2. Two seemingly random functions. Why these? Well, we'll see later. The goal for you, I want you to try and prove that n factorial grows at least as quickly as n over 2 to the n over 2. That is, it is big omega n over 2 to the n over 2. Uh, and your job is to uh, determine if that's true, and if so, or if not, prove your answer. Uh, and recall that informally, if you just want to think about what big omega means, you can think of it as it means something like greater than or equal to. So give yourself a couple of minutes. Maybe since this is a, a recording, five minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, and this is a problem that will probably make you feel a little dumb once you've seen the answer. Um, so give it a shot, see if you can prove this fact, and uh, I'll wait patiently and just kind of stare at you for a minute, try and convince you to try it out. Okay, so some spoilers. Uh, there are many ways to approach this problem. And, you know, one thing I sometimes encourage you guys to do is just go to Wolfram Alpha, for example. Uh, but what I'm going to say is that in this case, it's actually not going to be that instructive. I mean, I'll tell you a little bit. So we might try and compare these functions, n factorial and n over 2 to the n over 2. Uh, and we will see here a plot of that ratio. And uh, we'll see that this number seems to grow over time. So in other words, it appears that n factorial grows more quickly. Uh, so we could say, oh, okay, well, because this plot runs off to infinity, this must be true. n factorial grows at least as quickly as n over 2 to the n over 2. However, I find that unsatisfying, and you should too. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, suggest an alternate approach, which is pick an n and just expand it out, say 10. So 10 factorial, what is that? Well, that's 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times dot 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 times 1. Right? And what is n over 2 to the n over 2 for n equals 10? Well, n over 2 in this case would just be 5. Uh, and so 5 to the 5th would just be that. Uh, and so if we write this out, that's 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. Okay. Now if we pair the numbers here, we'll notice something interesting. 10, of course, is bigger than 5. And in fact, if we just look at the first half of n factorial versus all of n over 2 to the n over 2, all of these numbers are bigger. So this product is going to be larger than this product. Uh, oh, and also there's some bonus numbers here that make n factorial even bigger than n to the n, or n over 2 to the n over 2, right? So what we've done now is we've shown above that n factorial is always greater than n over 2 to the n over 2. Um, for large n. Uh, Alright, for large n, therefore, n factorial is this. Okay, so that's our proof. That's all we need. Alright, our next math problem. So given that n factorial is bigger than n over 2 to the n over 2, I would like you to compare the functions log n factorial and n log n using big omega notation. And in this case, log means an unspecified base. Okay, so whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. So I'll wait here and let you think about that. Uh, you can approach it either way you want. That is, you can decide log n factorial is big omega n log n, or the other way around and try and prove it. All right, so the direction I had in mind for you guys to solve was to find that log n factorial grows at least as quickly as n log n. So we have that n factorial uh, is greater than n over 2 to the n over 2. How can we use this fact to prove this? Well, uh, we can take the log of both sides, and that will give us that log n factorial is greater than log of n over 2 to the n over 2. 
From there, of course, we know that uh, log of x to the y is just y log x. So we can bring this exponent down, uh, and that gives us that log n factorial is greater than this right here. So straight away, throwing away this useless constant, um, that gives us that log n factorial grows at least as quickly as n log n over 2. Okay, uh, So we're getting close. And so from here, what we need to observe is that uh, the function n log n over 2 grows exactly as quickly as n log n. Okay? So from there, taking into account that fact, we have log n factorial is, grows at least as quickly as n log n. Uh, why does that work? Well, this step right here takes advantage of the fact that log of n over 2 over log n asymptotically converges to a constant. How do we show that? Well, log of a over b is just log a minus log b. Uh, and so if you write it out and you take the limit as uh, n goes to infinity, you will see that that goes to a constant. Okay? So basically what we've shown here is that log n factorial grows at least as quickly as n log n because of this observation we had uh, before. So why do we do this problem? Uh, well, we'll see in a little while. But I am going to take just a sharp turn. So this is actually all we need for the later part of the lecture. But I actually do want to bring up something funny. So when I created this slide, you know, on the previous slide it says, um, prove something about these functions using big omega notation. And I assume people would pursue this direction because that's what I did. But of course, you could try it the other way. And so it was that a student observed uh, that n log n, what the heck, who did such a thing? Oh my goodness, not rendering properly. Okay, we gotta make it whiter. Sometimes Google Slides doesn't render quite as nicely uh, as you want it to. All right, there we go. So someone raised the objection that we can also show that n log n grows at least as quickly as log n factorial. That is the other direction around. And this student's proof went as follows. Basically, log n factorial is log n plus log n minus 1 plus log n minus 2 down to log 1. And n log n is log n plus log n plus log n plus dot 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 plus log n. Uh, and therefore, if we match each of these, compare them, this right here is always larger than this for large n. Uh, and as a consequence, this uh, equation here grows more quickly uh, than log n factorial. So in other words, n log n uh, seems that uh, it is larger than log n factorial. Um, so there was some concern in class briefly that we had proven a contradictory fact, uh, but this statement right here is actually not right. It is not actually true that n log n is larger than log n factorial. All we're saying is that n log n grows at least as quickly as log n factorial. So in other words, how is it that we've proven that n log n grows at least as quickly as log n factorial? and that log n factorial grows at least as quickly as n log n? Well, there's no contradiction here. It just means that they grow at the same rate. That is, log n factorial is big theta n log n, and that n log n is also big theta log n factorial. So for large n, they're growing at the same rate. And so we can actually play around with this a little bit in uh, Wolfram Alpha. So here I have put these two functions together. We have log n factorial over n log n, and we'll see that over time, this function converges to some constant right here. Uh, and it'll keep going. Uh, and Wolfram, in this case, the, the, the engine that it's got built in, it tries and finds stuff, but you'll know it, notice it never, uh, it is never able to calculate the limit. Nonetheless, it is true that for large n, what we've just shown between this math problem and this math problem is that for large n, these two functions grow at the same rate. Cool stuff. All right, so that's it for our strange math problems of the day. And then we'll now move into, and I will teleport back into live lecture, uh, and we'll go through the rest of the lecture now armed with these math facts. OK, so we've proven both facts. They're, they're theta. And so now we're going to move away from our math problem. It ended up being a little more interesting than I thought. Uh, and we're going to talk about theoretical bounds on sorting. And all of our practice with these, uh, these functions is going to pay off. All right. So we've shown so far that there are several sorts that require n log n worst case time. And so the question is, could we do better? Say I had $10 million from Bill Gates, and I wanted to beat quick sort or merge sort. And your job is to go find me like an n log log n sort, or an n sort, or whatever, or a log n sort. So let's just say that we have some hypothetical sort called the ultimate comparison sort, or TUX, uh, which is the asymptotically fastest possible comparison sorting algorithm. Possibly we have not discovered it yet. We don't have a name for it. Super sort, whatever. Yeah. OK, it's called TUX for now, because we don't know what it is. And let's say that R of n is its worst case runtime in big theta notation. And by comparison sort, I mean that it uses, for example, the compare to method in Java to make decisions about who is bigger or smaller. Okay? So I can tell you right now that the worst case runtime of tux, whatever it is, that function R of n, that function of R, R of n that expresses uh, the worst case big theta runtime of tux is itself big O of n log n, that function R of n. Okay. So in other words, if we were to look at tux's worst case big theta runtime, Certainly, it could never be better, or sorry, 
Certainly, it's not going to be any worse than in login. Why is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, so we've already talked about other sorts you know are good, like quick sort or merge sort, right? And so is tux going to be at least as good as quick sort? Yeah, of course, because we defined it that way. It's a little ontological here. So the worst case runtime of tux, whatever it is, it's certainly going to be in log n or better. Okay? I can also say that the worst case runtime of tux is going to be at least constant time. It's not going to take less than constant time. And the argument there is sort of duh. It's like, okay, well, the problem isn't going to get easier as the number of items gets larger. So I'm going to be a very lazy bound, and I'll say that it, whatever tux is, it takes at least constant time, and it certainly could take, uh, it's not going to be any worse than n log n in the worst case. Is there something we could say even stronger than constant time? Like, I want a tighter bound. Prove to me you can't have a constant, yeah, I heard linear, right? Yeah. Yeah, it can't be better than n because you have to look at every element. So we can actually bound tux a little better and say that no matter what tux is, it's certainly not going to have a worst case runtime uh, that is better than n, because you have to look at every item. You could have some kind of goofball case like, what if you have a sorting algorithm you only use on sorted arrays and it just doesn't do anything? No. It has to work in the worst case. Okay? Tux needs at least n time. Now the question is, how good is tux? All right? We know that tux, there's a missing c, sorry, uh, lives between n and n log n. And the worst case runtime we know, basically, when I say it lives between these two functions, and saying that its worst case runtime is between n and n log n. Can we make some stronger statement to say that there's not even a linear time sort period that uses comparisons? And we'll see that with a clever argument, yes. However, very few such lower bounds exist, even for well-studied problems, uh, because basically what I'm saying with this lower bound here is that no matter what humans may ever think of, or cyborg aliens, or whatever the hell, no matter what, they can. we're stating that among the infinite space of all ideas out there, there's no better way uh, to sort than n. We can already say that, right? You have to look at every item. That's our argument. But to do better than n is quite difficult, and for almost every interesting problem out there, uh, or sorry, for lots of really interesting problems out there, we do not have a lower bound, but we do have one for sorting that is interesting. Okay? Yeah? Uh, yes, so on Wednesday, we'll talk about other types of sorts. Good point, right? How could you sort without comparison? Seems bizarre, but maybe you could. Okay? So here's my argument that I'd like to bring up. We're going to have a game. Okay? This is another one of those things that uh, the, the, the ideas are not difficult, but it, make, it seems it's surprisingly slippery. It makes you feel dumb. It taxes your working memory. Uh, and that game is puppy, cat, dog. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I have these cubes. And in each of these cubes, I'm going to put either the puppy, which is very small, the cat, which is medium-sized, or the dog. Uh, and they're in a soundproof, opaque box. Uh, and we're going to load them onto a scale and try and figure out who's in which box. So suppose it is the case that somebody has put one item or one animal in each of these, and I know that A is less than or B based on the scale, and that B is less than C. And let's assume they're unique weights. Uh, who's in which box? Who's in A? Puppy. Puppy. Great. Who's in B? Cat. Cat. Who's in C? Dog. Okay. So we know that. Okay. In other words, if we think about them in sorted order, it would be A, B, C. Right. OK, let's say the opposite happens. We find that A is not less than B, which, because they have unique weights, means A is greater than B. Uh, and then here we have B less than C. Well, that's also false, given the weights. So now we're starting to get into that space where there's double negatives, and it starts getting a little hard. But in this case, maybe using the most brute force intuition, uh, who's going to be which? Who's in box uh, A in this case? Dog. It's the biggest one, uh, because uh, what we have here is that A is not smaller than B, and B is not smaller than C, which is another way of saying that A is the biggest. Uh, and then who's in the middle? Cat. And uh, in the far end, we have uh, puppy and box C. So I've written them backwards here. So in this case, the sorted order is C, B, A. OK. Another one for you. Suppose, then, that we do weighing, and we find that A is less than B, uh, but B is not less than C. Uh, which one is which? OK, and I'll give you guys a minute to think about it. Okay, and this is for three. Once you get above three, it's real bad. Okay. I'm going to pu push this. Okay, so it's up.
So my hint is if uh, something says no, then write it the other way as a greater than. There was one vote, and then they took it back. <laughs> All right. What do you guys think? Yeah? There's not enough information. In fact, there's two possibilities. It could be that the sorted order is A is less than B, and C is less than B. Uh, A is less than C, C is less than B. Yeah, so look at this. So if we look at this ordering, A is less than B in both of these orders, right? Here's A, here's B, here's A, here's B. Uh, and if we look at this one, we're saying B is not less than C, Right? Uh, so in that case, we're basically saying that uh, B needs to be over towards the right of C. So A is less than B, and B is to the right of C, and there are actually two possibilities that fulfill those requirements, A, B, and B, C. Right? Okay. Good? Okay. So we don't actually know how to, uh, which, or who's the puppy, who's the cat, and who's the dog, so what could we ask to resolve this question? What's an example of a question that would let us sort this out once and for all? Yeah, we could compare A and C. So I could say, is A less than C? So suppose it were true that A is less than C. Which of these two possibilities would it be? So A is less than C. Which is the sorted order in that case? This one, number two. So in that case, A, C, B. So in other words, A is the puppy, because it's the leftmost one. C is the cat, it's the middle one. B is the dog. So these problems, as you move your way from n equals 3 to 4 to 5 and so forth, they really tax your working memory. And in fact, uh, the game of puppy, cat, dog, uh, finding the optimal set of questions for uh, puppy, cat, dog is only known for certain n. And I'll tell you what they are soon. Okay? But basically what we could do, we could portray the game of puppy, cat, dog as a game of 20 questions. Though in this case, it won't be quite so many. So if a is less than b, we could say, well, maybe that's true. So if that's true, we could ask the question, is b less than c? In that case, if the answer were yes, uh, do we know enough information? Yeah, we're good. We can say that A is the puppy, B is the cat, C is the dog. That's what we said earlier. Now here's that case I just had you guys think about. We would ask a follow-up question. If the answer were yes, we have puppy, cat, dog. If the answer were no, oh, sorry. If the answer were yes, we'd have A puppy, C cat, B dog. If the answer were no, we have C puppy, A cat, B dog. All right? So you see how this game is played. And you can actually draw out the entire decision tree and show that this right here is a set of questions that could allow you to answer the que figure out who's in which box. Okay? Now, we'll notice there's like a little bit of an asymmetry here, which maybe feels a little ugly. Sometimes we need two questions to figure out who's who. Sometimes we need three. So is there a way? Could you design a set of questions such that you can always figure out who's who in two, uh, in two guesses, or in two questions? Could you come up with even more clever questions, another tree? with pairwise comparisons, crucially, uh, that will resolve this? No. Why? Visually. So what do we notice here? There are six blue nodes, six leaves. And if we only had two questions, how many leaves would there be in this decision tree? Four. And that's just impossible. We can't do better than that. So we need at least three questions to resolve puppy, cat, dog, because there are six different possibilities. Okay? Notice A, B, C, A, C, B. B, A, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, C, B, A. Okay? So puppy, cat, dog, you cannot solve it in less than three questions. All right. Another question to see if that made sense. How many questions we need to solve it for n equals four? You don't have to draw the decision tree. I just want you to use, uh, you're into, you, give me a bound that feels like the right one, uh, which says, how many would you need for n equals four where we want to figure out who's the puppy, cat, dog, and walrus? So think about this one, and I will push this question and give you guys a minute.
All right. Let's see how we're doing. Okay. So, let's think about this. If there's n equals 4, how many different possibilities are there for the four boxes? We have puppy, cat, dog, walrus. The answer's on the slide, but what's the idea? So there are four factorial of them, because basically if you put the puppy, the cat, the dog, and the walrus and permuted them randomly, there would be a factorial number of permutations. You may not remember this, but it's a thing probably at some point you learned in, I would guess, pre-calculus. Um, it's not too hard to convince yourself of this, uh, but I'll just say trust me for now. So if there are n equals 4, we know there are 24 permutations, right? Because it's just 3 factorial times 4. So in other words, if we were to think about this picture we had before, we're going to have a tree which has 24 of these blue nodes, or leaves. And so if you want 24 leaves, how many levels do you need? Well, you're going to need log base 2, the ceiling of that. We're going to actually need 5 questions. Similar to here, in order to have 6, we needed uh, 3 questions in the worst case. Here, if we have 24 different choices, we're going to need 5 levels. It's a, it's a direct argument. Uh, and so LG, when I say LG24, I'm just saying log base 2. Okay? So we need five questions in order to answer this puzzle. Any questions about this? OK. Uh, so this is a short question. I'll give you guys 45 seconds on this one. Suppose you generalize to n. How many questions do you need to ask in order to figure out who's in which box for n items? Okay. So you get 45 seconds. There's no poll everywhere on this one. All right. So what do you guys think? Yeah. Uh, There's a shorter answer. Yeah. Yeah, log of n factorial. All right. But we'll come to that one in a moment. All right. So we need log n factorial rounded up levels, which is just uh, log n factorial. Okay. Yeah, there's a ceiling function, but it doesn't actually affect our big omega. So we need at least log n factorial questions. Okay. So why is this interesting? Well, um, this is the thing I alluded to earlier, that if you tried to play puppy, cat, dog, walrus, monkey, elephant, or whatever, uh, that is an open problem in mathematics. How many questions do you need? Uh, or sorry, rather, what is the sequence of questions that is optimal? Uh, we know the best known trees for n equals 1 through 15. Oh, and by the way, n equals 22. Yeah. Deriving a sequence of yes-no questions to figure out puppy, cat, dog is hard. Uh, and so there's an alternate approach. right? If you tried to sit down and come up with the solution for monkey, cat, dog, walrus, elephant, puppy, all that, uh, your brain would explode. It's extremely difficult. There's a lot of thinking. There's a, uh, it's, it's, it really taxes the working memory. Uh, and so we have actually a solution already, which is that we can use sorting. I said earlier that sorting is a generic tool. And so it is. You can use sorting to figure out who's the puppy, who's the cat, and who's the dog, because sorting basically gives you a sequence of comparisons that lets you put stuff in order. So imagine I have three boxes, A, B, C, and I perform merge sort, or insertion sort, or selection sort, using a scale to weigh them. And I eventually put them in order, OK? So once I have this is the smallest one, who's that? It's your leftmost one, puppy, right? So once you've sorted, it's very easy to win puppy, cat, dog. You're basically done. It's trivial. So I sort them. The leftmost one's puppy. The middle one's cat. The rightmost one is dog. Uh, and so we're done. We don't actually have to build the decision tree. And we can use this for any number. So why do we care about this? What does that have to do with anything? All right. Well, the point here is that a solution to the sorting problem, if you can sort, you can also solve puppy, cat, dog. So in other words, we could say puppy, cat, dog reduces. That's the word we used uh, in last, um, when did we use that? Uh, dynamic programming lecture. Puppy, cat, dog reduces to sorting. So anything we can say about the, uh, giving a lower bound on the difficulty of puppy, cat, dog must also apply to sorting. That's kind of a deep point that comes up in theory. And we have to be very careful about reductions and so forth if we were to make this formal. But for our purposes, the idea is basically like this. Okay, I'm going to use a physics analogy, and then I'll come back to the math. Uh, so climbing up a hill with your legs, right? It's cow will, is one way to solve the problem of getting up a hill. What's an alternate solution? Driving, catapult, whatever. Regardless, any lower bound on the energy it takes you to get up a hill must also apply to walking up a hill with your legs or climbing up a hill. So in physics, we might say it takes mgh energy to climb this hill crudely. Uh, then using your legs to climb the hill takes at least mgh energy. That's just how it's going to be. Okay? 
doesn't matter. You know, you have some extra friction losses, whatever. Similar idea here. If we can prove that puppy cat dog takes a certain number of comparisons to solve, then anything we do that involves comparisons to solve puppy cat dog will also uh, have to obey that bound, right? I'm proving to you. I can write in a stone tablet with a laser. Puppy cat dog takes big omega uh, log n factorial comparisons. So that also applies to sorting, okay? So in other words, because you can use tux, remember our magical algorithm, to solve puppy cat dog, uh, then no matter how clever we are, we know it's going to take at least log n factorial compares to find the correct permutation, basically. Uh, so in other words, we can bound tux below by log n factorial. So tux needs to take at least log n factorial time. Okay? So we have that lower bound. Before we had n, now we have log n factorial. But this function is really useless to us. We barely know what it means. But luckily, we got to do that really fun math exercise at the beginning. And we have a relationship between log n factorial and n log n. In particular, we showed that log n factorial is big omega n log n. And yes, the other way around is true. And so what we can say is that, in other words, log n factorial grows at least as fast as n log n. Okay? And this is our, our little proof here. All right. So in other words, because tux is big omega log n factorial, and log n factorial is in turn big omega n log n, we have that tux is big omega n log n. So what I can say now is that any comparison-based sort takes at least n log n comparisons. And so basically, if you just summarize the whole, like the whole way we walked through this thing, we said puppy cat dog takes log n factorial comparisons, tux can solve puppy cat dog, and thus it also must take uh, log n factorial compares. And because log n factorial is n log n, uh, we have this whole chain that basically says tux is harder than puppy cat dog, which is harder than log n factorial, which is harder than n log n. And when I was using the word harder, I meant it very informally. I just meant uh, is at least as hard as. So any thoughts about this argument? Okay, so it's a tricky one, right? I mean, it took us a lot of a day. I mean, we did take it pretty slow. Um, but basically what we've shown is that no matter what sorting algorithm you come up with, because we have a bound on puppy cat dog, and this solves it, we have a bound on uh, the best sorting algorithm. So what does this tell us? Could we do better than merge sort asymptotically using comparisons? No, right? Because if we could, we'd somehow be breaking the rules we came up with puppy, cat, dog. Now, we didn't write it in the, the level of mathematical rigor with all the axioms and so forth so that it really feels truly 100% crisp. We relied on our intuition a little. But again, you know, 170, this is the place where you'll really, really, really dig deep into this. Okay? But this is essentially the argument. Yeah. Which orders of magnitude? These here? Uh, so what I'm showing here is that the ultimate sorting algorithm, I mean, it lies between n log n and n log n, so there's no room. Yeah. Oh, but are they quantized in general? Yeah. That's an interesting question. Uh, uh, let's see. So basically, I think we're asking if there's a countable or an uncountable infinity of uh, functions in between any two functions. Not sure. OK. I mean, it's a good question. But it's a, little, it's a little technical for our day. Because you can keep making up more things, like n log 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 n, for example. However long you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, here, though, we know it's between n log n and n log n. There's no room. We've squeezed it. Okay? So in other words, we look at the punchline of our whole day's arguments here. We have that heap sort, merge sort, and randomized quick sort are all n log n. Quick sort's expected n log n. And so what we've done is we've shown that our best sorts so far have achieved absolute asymptotic optimality. There's no way to do better. Call it a day. Don't need to give anybody $10 million to find a comparison-based sort that's n log n. Okay? Um, so there you go. OK. Any closing thoughts on that before I show you another cool thing? All righty. Um, so one fun thing about sorting, of course, is that these algorithms have so much richness, but they're, they're comfortable enough that they fit in your brain so that you can watch, for example, and you might have seen something like this before, uh, visualizations and also sonifications of sorting algorithms. So I will show you here the sorts we've learned, which now we know are asymptotically optimal. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is it's going to start with selection sort. And when you watch this, anytime you see a red color, it means that that item is being considered, and we'll see an items, our items getting sorted. Okay. Now.
in case it isn't clear what the visualization means, this is just an array where this is like the number 85, 86, 87. Uh, this number might be what? 20. Great. This one might be 30. So that's what's going on. So the bar is proportional to the length of the item. Continue. <laughs> All right, this is quick sort. So watch how it behaves. This is using the whore partitioning strategy that has the pointers that hate and love L and G. That's pretty good, and that's fast. It did a lot more numbers than the others because it's asymptotically optimal using puppy cat dog arguments. Okay, next up we got murder. <laughs> Sort. Okay, all right. <laughs> Why does merge sort get a clap? It's so boring. All right, heap sort. This one's real good. So heap sort. What's the first step of heap sort? Heapify. So this is going to be heapify first. Why is it doing this? Going from right to left. What's it doing right now? Pulling out the largest thing, actually. So it's building a max heap. Let's start from the beginning again so you can get all that. So satisfying. Uh, heap sort gets a clap. So one thing I want to note is, remember I said how heap sort's not very fast because of caching? Caching is basically that computers don't like jumping in memory large distances. So if you watch heap sort, <laughs> array all at once. So that's the secret 61C thing you haven't learned left yet. OK, so that's heap sort. And then we have, uh, so this is going to be the sort we talk about on Wednesday, which is literally called LSD sort. It is not comparison based, and it runs in linear time, not in log n. So let's watch this one that we'll learn about on Wednesday. All right, pretty cool. So what we've done now. So we proved today that no comparison-based sort could beat n log n. Next time, we'll do sorting in n time. And we'll do it by not doing any comparisons, and that will be LSD sort. All righty. See you next time. Algebra. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, please do. <laughs>